All right, class, welcome back uh, to week, I think we're on week four now of History 112. Um, just some quick housekeeping once again. Um, the podcast analysis assignments, the groups are posted under the assignments and papers. You can see that right there. Uh, just look at it ASAP because some of you in the first group are not doing it this Friday, the 6th anymore. It's going to be the 13th. Now, that was due to uh, pretty poor planning on my part, so I apologize for that. I really wanted the podcast assignments to be as relevant as possible to the assignments, the, the, um, the chapters we're going over, and that means it would be most relevant to this week, um, especially with what's about to happen with the hurricane and just in life in general for you guys. That was really unfair for me to ask ask you to do that in a two-day turnaround, so I really apologize. So don't worry about it until the 13th, those of you in the first group. If you don't know, if you're in what group, you know, because you were supposed to send me your requests or otherwise I assigned you them, go to podcast analysis right here. Podcast analyses, those are the groups. I remember the sixth deadline is now the 13th. I can go back in there and change that, I think. Um, all right, what else is happening? Let me pull up our schedule. So yeah, week four, we're talking about oceans crossed, worlds connected from 1450 to 1550 today. Um, yeah, and keep that in mind that this is moved down here now. Okay. Uh, once again, there's going to be a discussion board posted um, for this chapter uh, that will go off the lecture and also the text. Um, so be, be sure to be using the text along with what I'm talking about to answer these discussion boards in a more profound, extensive way. Um, because we want complete sentences in these discussion boards, I want to see your analytical brains working about why things matter in the past. And remember to always take advantage of the notes, the, the, the note outlines that I give you. Um, otherwise, uh, especially if you're using the e-text, there are useful online things for you as well, okay? Um, let me see if there's anything else we need to talk about. Um, I think that's about it. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So let's just dive into it, okay? Oceans cross, worlds connected. Let me get situated with my notes and my text real quick, and I'll be right back. All right, so this chapter opens up with a, uh, all these introductions, usually in these chapters, open up with like a nice anecdotal story. Uh, this one's actually really interesting because it talks about an African ruler, Mansa Muhammad, who uh, actually uh, was a patron of many um, daring voyages out into the Atlantic Ocean, um, just on very rudimentary um, canoes or rafts, if you will. And uh, at first, he sent out a voyage. Um, they eventually got caught in the strong, strong currents that are off the coast there. And only one of his um, vessels was able to return and talked about how magnificent these currents were. So, greatly intrigued by this, Mansa Muhammad led another one after this, but never returned. Okay? So don't don't lose sight that many of these explorations, many of these efforts made by you know conquistadors, that's what we typically think about with exploration uh, in this period, but many, many people were setting sail across the oceans trying to find new lands, and these included Africans, those of the Asian continent, and of course Europeans as well. So overall, this is a, a chapter here talking about a great... Uh, a great many people, a convergence of people, plants, animals, uh, literally the microbes and the diseases that, that were apparent in all these different societies were coming together. Now, like I mentioned, there were previous knowledge of explorations before this, but they really didn't understand the currents at all. Not like they would eventually understand them. But by the end of the 16th century, we're really going to start to get a sense for a global economy, which is going to have huge ramifications, especially when we, excuse me, when we talk about the larger, what's called the Atlantic world, okay? Let's dig right 
So if you take a look here, this is an overview of all the different people that are covered in this chapter. I'm going to do my damnedest to try and cover them all as best as I can, as, as concisely as possible. But otherwise, of course, please refer to your text if you have questions or if I didn't emphasize something enough for your liking. Just know you have the resources out there. All right. So on the eve of great of the great world convergence, what important changes were taking place in economic and political life in both Afro-Eurasia and the Americas as of about 1450? So changes in the Afro-Eurasian trade network. Um, because everybody was starting to rebound from the Black Death, there was great improved environmental conditions. Uh, food production increased, and as a result, population increased. Uh, but one of the things that uh, really set this off, of course, was caravan traffic and maritime shipping, specifically into Asia. Asia was the, uh, as you can see here, the, the Chinese trade pump. We'll get into that in a little bit. But um, actually, the quote-unquote city life um, that we come to associate with many things in modernity, things of the modern era, out of the 25 really advanced cities in Afro-Eurasia, that huge landmass, 17 of them were actually Asian cities. There were four in your more, um, more northern Africa and four in Europe as well. Okay. Um, the South China Sea was really the main trade route we should think about at this time. It really linked all these together. But the Chinese trade pump, in 1433, the Ming Dynasty stopped state expeditions. We mentioned last week about Zhong He and his explorations. Uh, State-sponsored explorations didn't really exist in the Ming Dynasty anymore. Uh, but they still were able to maintain a maritime commerce. Uh, and this was due to large part by rich elites and those, remember, those cities, those urban centers, those rich elite people wanted luxury goods and they had to get them somewhere. Okay. Um, something the book talks about is the Entrepot of Malacca, which was established in 1403 by a Singapore ruler who was ousted from, you know, where, where he had been. Um, and this is the, leading to an understanding of setting up islands as, as trading posts. This is happening in Asia, of course. Now, this place had it a protected harbor and made it perfect for this type of shipping. The merchants of Gugarit um, were established in 1401, That's that city there. The rulers um, that established this environment broke off from the Sultanate of Delhi, who were actually making a, a large amount of money off of exported cotton, a lot of refined cotton and textiles there. And the importance of this area, if I can get an idea where I'm talking about. So of course, the Ming Empire here in China. I'm talking about this empire right here. Small, 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 but important. There's the Malacca Sultanate. As you can see here, more or less kind of middlemen along the trade routes through the Indian Ocean. The South China Sea here, linking through Malacca into Jugardit, into Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, and into Africa, okay? So this connected South Asia to not only Eastern Africa, but the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea itself. Um, and it's said through people at the time that these exports not only worked their way into Cairo, but also onward uh, deeper into Alexandria. So Cairo, as we know, is a little further up the Nile. Further down is Alexandria. And Alexandria had a great trade relationship with Venice. So imagine that for a second. These people here in this very small area were a critical link between the Ming Dynasty all the way into Venice. It's pretty remarkable. Now, Europeans, 
uh, continued to look east for all of their goods. Uh, they sought to buy their products cheaply and sell them at uh, expensive, increased inflated rates to make a profit, of course. And one of the ways they were successful at doing that was because they had gold and silver to give Asian states. Uh, Asian areas did not have great mining like Europeans did or Africans did. And of course, there were overland travels by European merchants. Um, we should be familiar with one guy, Marco Polo, who was very, we, we think is being unique, but he actually wasn't in the grand scheme of things. There were many people just like Marco Polo leading up to 1350, Italian merchants going deep into China, gaining knowledge and more intense understanding of how trade worked. So we're going to talk about the Eastern Atlantic Rim. So the Eastern Atlantic Rim, uh, we should focus more first on the Strait of Gibraltar. Which, let me go back to my trusty map here. Strait of Gibraltar is this area, that little point between Spain and North Africa. There was a great many competition among the, uh, the states on the Iberian Peninsula and in Western Africa, Western North Africa, excuse me. There remained a great river of commerce. Um, great analogy there. But by the mid 13th century, those three monarchies, Castile, Aragon, and Portugal itself, could, took control away from the Muslim population who was threatening, quote unquote, uh, Christian civilization, they thought. Uh, there was a great use of the straits to explore up and down the western coast of Africa. The Vivaldi brothers of 1291 were one such people. Um, even northern, even more northern into the British Isles. Of course, this led to the establishment of uh, forts and trading posts at um, Madeira and the Canary Islands which eventually set up sugar plantations as well. Uh, tropical Africa uh, that faced the Atlantic had a strong monarchical tradition in the Western Sudan. There was increased agriculture in this very fertile region, um, some light manufacturing of um, luxury goods, but overall, what we should really consider about them are the empires that the state has been in here, okay, and the Congo. That's what we're talking about first. We don't really get into the Mali or the Songhai Empire. Very interesting, but we're not talking about them right now because what we want to emphasize are the Europeans going down this coast and eventually, of course, around that coast, all right? There's a better image of it. So something that characterized the Benin state was it had state-sponsored building projects, uh, which were ordered by their kings, which their, the term for that were obas. Now the Benin state was located mainly around the Niger River. Now, the Kingdom of Congo um, looks a little smaller, but it still encompassed a, a good amount of coastline, uh, very prominent for its agriculture and mining of copper and ivory, which were, of course, highly prized in European markets. But most interesting was the Republic of Congo actually had 500,000 people living in it. An incredible number. And here we get a better sense of the Strait of Gibraltar. And look how many competing states are right around the center. You can tell that everybody knew whoever controlled this would be able to keep the outsiders out and friendly allies could pass through. And here we see the Azores, the Madeira Islands, the Canary Islands, the Cape Verde Islands, all incredibly important, important in the early discovery 
of trade routes. Now, of course, we mentioned uh, states and the Americas, um, I guess, a, a couple weeks ago, but let's reemphasize them here because the text tells me to. Of course, the Aztec Empire was centered in the Valley of Mexico starting in the 15th century. The Nahuatl speaking people incorporated others into their fold via violence, mainly. And they largely ruled indirectly from the capital of Tenochtitlan. The population of that entire empire was probably around 25 million people, had an incredibly large standing army, and lots and lots of social stratification that went along with it. The Inca Empire, in contrast, was in the Valley of Cusco starting about 1438, about the same time. A smaller population, but still um, incredibly large considering uh, the type of terrain they had to navigate. Just look at that. Of course, this is Machu Picchu, right? So, um, eventually they would have over 770,000 square miles of coastland under their sway. And they did so by incorporating captured kingships into a very complex bureaucratic government. So what factors contributed to the establishment of regular seaboard communication across the Atlantic Ocean in the late 15th century? Well, one of the first things, most notably, was the changing maritime technology. Now, shipbuilding took on a whole different shape and form at this time. Uh, up until this point, ships had been pretty, I don't want to call them mediocre, but they, they had a purpose. The Mediterranean was much calmer than the Atlantic Ocean. So there was no need for very large, heavy drafted ships. But um, it, it's important to contrast these with the Chinese ships. Um, Chinese ships, especially under Zhong He, were gigantic things. And they would have been incredibly perfect, actually, for braving the Atlantic or Pacific waters. But they never really got a chance. It was meant, remember, more as a symbol of that empire. But uh, in the 15th century, these shipbuilders decided they needed to reverse the process of actually how they built their ships. In earlier times, they built the holes, uh, the, the outer shell, first um, by attaching these wooden planks to one another and then constructing a frame within that hole. Um, I wish we had a better image for that. It's hard to visualize, but um, what they eventually did in the 15th century was they reversed that whole structure. It seems more logical, right? And it's actually much, much quicker to build a skeleton of this ship first and then do the do the planks. So they can make these ships quicker with less material waste, thereby also making the ships cheaper. These stronger ships could support multiple masts, and this is going to be one of the most important differences between ships before and now. So now we have different types of sails. The typical square sail was what many Mediterranean vessels used, just for what are called galley ships, that also had um, a lot of um, oarsmen to power it. But it's not really practical when you're fighting the winds. So what they had to do was create lanteen sails, triangular ones that were more manipulative that um, that were able to be pushed around and even use the wind that they are sailing against. And the Portuguese started this with the caravel, which is a light, hot, very maneuverable sailing vessel um, starting in the 15th and 16th centuries. And what was different about this, of course, was because it had those Latin sails. And it was actually pretty small. It was only probably, the book says here, about 65 to 80 feet long. Um, but the most important thing was it had room for supplies. You know, typically those galley ships 
the room in those ships was devoted towards the crew to power it manually, right? So now they have cargo space, places to put stuff. Now there's another bigger version, which is called a crack. Okay, that's how you should think about it. A, a more ocean-going ship, larger than the caravel, in that same time period. Uh, these cracks had multiple decks for storing all types of cargo and had crew quarters and um, high castles and platforms for defending themselves. And eventually these cracks became, you know, the mainstay of transoceanic trade. Now, before this, navigation was... Um, there were navigational skills that were involved in uh, getting from point A to point B on ships, of course. But mostly, because it was the Mediterranean, they kept the shoreline within sight, and they used landmarks. And of course, they were able to navigate themselves celestially by the stars. Now, this is still going to be used, but eventually this was adopted um, and improved upon. Because European sailors used astrolabes and quadrants, these things that actually were... Um, manipulated, not manipulated, they were refined by early Muslim artisans, which um, calculated the height of things above us. Another great advancement was actually charting and mapping out the Atlantic winds and the currents, because remember we talked about at the beginning, uh, Mansa Muhammad those even in Africa started to recognize that the currents and winds were totally different out in the Atlantic. Eventually, they started to learn that the north. Let me go back to a map to explain this. There we go. They started to realize that the the winds in the northern part of the Atlantic run this direction, and then back up. So, in theory. It was easier for a ship to sail south and then directly west, which is what they ended up doing. And when coming back, they wanted to go as north as possible, ride out that wave as much as possible, the currents, to come back around. Now, even if they were fighting against that, they were able to do so because of these latine sails. Because these were actually kind of maneuverable. They, were, they, they swung. So every time a ship would be fighting the wind, they would have to do a zigzag pattern to get to where they were going, manipulating those sails. Really ingenious, and uh, I mean, it took a little while, but they were able to navigate these these winds and these currents that they were really shocked by at first, actually. So, how big is the world to these 15th century people? Um, actually, at this time, it was pretty well agreed on that it, the world was round. But they, where they disagreed a lot was on how big it was. I'm not going to get into the nuances of it. But just know that um, many of these 15th century hypotheses were indeed wrong. They greatly underestimated how large the world was. Um, and that motivated tons and tons of people, of course, Christopher Columbus being the most notorious, to strike out and test them to see if the world really was not as big as they thought it was. But guess what? It was even bigger. Here you see an early map representation of them starting to toy with the idea of what the world looked like. Of course, this is the Atlantic Ocean, and they're missing a lot, right? A whole continent. So let's talk about these early encounters between the Europeans and West Africans. The Portuguese had a coastal trade and exploration that extended downward and south. Um, typically, they, they, they sought to, of course, aim for profit from gold and other products that these African agrarian societies were willing to sell. And actually, they were met pretty um, with open arms a lot of times. 
And one of the times these people met was, of course, once again in Benin and in, in the Congo. Uh, the Portuguese merchants uh, really wanted that they ended up getting authorization from the king of Benin to, to buy pepper and export it back to Europe. Um, they even took cloth um, into market and in European markets for them. This is the beginning of buying slaves, African slaves, from the Africans themselves. This is also the establishment of the island of Sao Tome. And once again, sugar plant plantations on an uninhabited island in the Gulf of Guinea. Now to work on such an island, there was a need for labor, of course, and that labor were slaves. Now, Sao Tome became an important assembly point for captives destined to be shipped um, eventually over to Brazil. We'll get to Brazil in a little bit. Now, one of the main things from the Portuguese time was rounding the Cape of Good Hope. And the guy that did that was Vasco da Gama, who drew on an earlier explorer's efforts, Diaz, uh, ten year, a decade before that. So actually what uh, Vasco da Gama did, because they're starting to learn more about those winds, he sailed uh, southwest until he caught those winds that brought him back to the coast just north of the Cape. So here on this very inaccurate map, so what he did was he came out here, hit those winds, and ended up down here, okay? And this is an early representation of one of these conquistadors. Now, the, the, of course, the one we think about most are Columbus's Atlantic voyage. And now Columbus had an earlier expedition uh, when he visited the Gulf of Guinea in 1482. And remember, he was informed by many thinkers and scholars who greatly underestimated the size of the world. And he became convinced that an ocean voyage between um, Spain, as we'll call it, and East Asia was possible. And uh, he eventually was able to gain the, the trust of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain uh, to finance this voyage. And they did so not because they really, really trusted him or they thought, I don't know, but the main thing they were trying to do was trying to find a, a trade route to Asia, which was not blocked by the Muslim navies, um, and who actually imposed a lot of taxes upon European merchants traveling that way. Now we know that Christopher Columbus reached the Bahamas or the Turks and Caicos archipelago, um, but we really don't know the location for sure. We do know he came in contact with the Taino uh, Native Americans, um, who eventually he enslaved. But actually at first he was really emphasizing uh, their, their nakedness of the locals. He, he thought it was really breathtaking. He was astonished by it. But he, and, and, and some, he, he thought they were really rational. Um, they were able to be converted. And this led to further exploitation of Native Americans, of course. And within three decades, round trips were happening into the Caribbean. And eventually this led to uh, the Pope, Pope Alexander VI, creating the Treaty of Tordesillas. Now this was in order to put some stability in uh, a literally a law on paper 
to decide who was controlling what. Now, there we go. That's the map I wanted. Here we can see the line of the Tree of Tordesia, which actually defined that everything to the east of that was to be the Portuguese territory. So we see that, of course, um, the Madeira Islands, the Canary Islands, we see literally the words Portuguese, Portuguese. This is Brazil, of course. So who got the raw end of the stick? The Portuguese did. The Portuguese started all these ideas. But actually, they kind of got screwed. They didn't know how extensive Amer the Americas were or how much labor was here. It was just a combination of ignorance of the time and just, just not knowing in general. But everything to the west belonged to Spain. So Spain was able to manipulate all these empires, of course, and able to, to tax them and get the resources from them, while the Portuguese were only allowed this small spot of this. That doesn't mean that the, the Portuguese didn't exploit that. They totally, totally did. But in the grand scheme of things, Spain got more out of the deal. So, let's look at this map some more. This is a very busy map of Portuguese, Spanish, English, and French exploration. Now, of course, there's even smaller explorers that aren't even mentioned up here. And there was an explorer who, many explorers who actually established um, temporary forts right here in North and South Carolina that don't make the cut on this map, unfortunately, but they were there. So then let's talk about the American catastrophes, excuse me. Because um, keep in mind that typically, in the grand scheme of things, when we compare these interactions between Europeans and early Americans and Europeans and these early Africans, these sub-Saharan sub Africans typically had a good diplomatic relationship with the Europeans. Sometimes that didn't play out very well, but in the grand scheme of things, they were able to not suffer the population loss that would occur from Native Americans. Of course, uh, one of the main things was the pure military advantages that occurred at this time. Having the ability to have um, machinery and weaponry that the Native Americans never knew, brutal tactics, torture, rampant torture of people to get information. But the most important, of course, is disease. And that does not, um, that of course includes the, the diseases Europeans took back to Europe as well. The main one being syphilis. But smallpox was the, the disease that really knocked the many Native Americans out. We call all this the Columbian Exchange, and actually this term is actually a pretty new idea. It came out in the 80s by a guy named Alfred Crosby. But um, this is, a, as the book calls it, a biological revela revolution. Because as you can imagine, these are pathogens and Im immunities that have never been explored, never been tested. And they're definitely being tested now. So just keep in mind, once again, the main thing coming to the Americas in terms of disease is smallpox. The main thing coming back from the Americas in terms of disease is syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease. Now, the, another problem about this whole era is the European quote-unquote labor problem. Now, owning the labor of others was kind of tricky. They needed to have a legal system in place. So the Spanish established something called the encomienda system. Now, this was a grant from the Spanish crown to its uh, settlers, its uh, explorers, the governors that were there, giving them the rights to labor and um, receiving the payments of the indigenous people in a certain area. That's an immense, immense amount of leverage. In some ways, these, these Native Americans under the system 
were entitled to legal freedoms, um, property ownership, and sometimes wages for their labor. But overall, they were still indeed thought of to be less than them. Now, we're not quite yet talking about race-based slavery, but of course that happened not shortly after because the Native American population had dwindled so badly. And um, one of the ideas that perpetuated this was Bartholomew or Bartholomé de las Casas, who wrote a, a very uh, critical essay, a book critiquing the Spanish crown for its treatment of Native American people. And it led to some new reforms and laws. But actually what ended up happening was he more or less supported um, the enslavement of Africans. So, of course, uh, many of these reasons led to the downfall of the Aztec Empire. Montec Zoma, uh, his, his name is spelled, uh, I've seen it spelled like six different ways, um, but Montezuma is typically what we think about. Um, he was leading the Triple Alliance at this time. He had just come to power, uh, but actually he, um, it was, things weren't all so rosy in the Aztec Empire. There were a lot of festering divisions, a lot of, I would call them civil wars, because a lot of these tribute states, they had been tributing to the Aztec Empire for a long, long time, and they were fed up with it. So keep that in mind, because when a guy like Hernan Cortez comes around, that's going to be ready, those are going to be ready allies for the Europeans. And actually, it wasn't the Aztec army that these Europeans fought first, but it was actually warriors, Tlaxcalan warriors, who put up a clash between them. Tlaxcalans, uh, they lost, of course, due to the military might of the Europeans, but they decided that these, um, these outsiders, these pale-faced, bearded people, might be really useful for their fight against um, the Mexica people, you know, the Aztec people. So they negotiated an alliance and they joined the ranks of Cortez. And eventually they, even other groups um, who were weary of Aztec oppression joined them. So really what ended up happening was Cortez with just a very small amount of Europeans was able to gain the trust of Native American people who did not like Montezuma and the Aztecs at all. And one of the things um, that was very tragic at this time was the, the, the death of Montezuma, who uh, supposedly welcome, more or less welcomed Cortez inside the city to show off his wealth. Montezuma was taken captive and, um, and eventually killed uh, in the ensuing uh, hubbub in the city. Um, his successor ruled for about three months and uh, contracted smallpox once again. Uh, really important for the Native American people, uh, the, the smallpox contraction. Um, eventually, Cortez and the, and the uh, reinforcements that he, he gained um, filled the streets of Tenochtitlan with dead bodies and the sick people. Being able to do do that to the Aztec Empire just meant it was much easier for more armed Europeans to arrive and extend Spanish control across Mexico and Central America. Of course, as a result of this, the population of the Aztec realm um, dropped precipitously. Um, by all estimates, probably like 95%. Um, the hard numbers we have are, are tough, but let's just say from... 25.2 million right before Europeans got there. Um, but by 1623, it was less than 1 million Native Americans uh, who were originally Aztecs. Of course, the Incan Empire faced a similar fate as well. Um, just keep in mind that it was just a similar type of thing as well. The Incan people had 
um, even though they were sometimes more diplomatic maybe, they still had a lot of shifting alliances, um, a lot of um, unfaithful tributary states who were ready to see the Incan Empire fall. And uh, of course, disease played a huge part in that. And Francisco Pizarro and the Pizarro brothers um, were able to wrestle power away from the Incan ruler. So let's talk about what they did after dealing with these empires. So this really launched uh, the Spanish domination of the Americas um, all the way from what is now uh, California to almost to the tip of South America, right on the edge of Patagonia. Um, the Native American population kept dropping, 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 dropping. Um, but in order to establish a working government, they established a lot of laws and reforms, one of which was founding the House of Trade, or the Casa de Contracción, to closely regulate and tax the flow of commerce, actually. Um, they established um, the, the areas that were occupied by the Aztecs and the areas occupied by the Incans as viceroys, who um, that was an official appointed by the monarchs to govern um, a colonial dependency or something that was reliant on the mother country. And one viceroyalty was New Spain, of course governed from the former Aztec capital, which is now called Mexico City. The other one was Peru, its new colonial capital of Lima. They established royal judicial courts called audiencias. The Catholic Church, of course, was involved, including uh, religious orders like the Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits, because they sought to convert them. And this is where Bartolome de las Casas comes into play because he was a priest. Here you can see the different vice royalties. New Spain and Peru. Okay. And don't forget that the Portuguese are involved too, right here on the coast of Brazil. Remember the T Treaty of Tordesillas? Blocks them off right about there. They were able, uh, the Europeans were able to initiate a, a really profitable trade in the woods that were in there, actually from extracting a lot of really rich, really important um, textile dyes from the wood there. But the Europeans uh, eventually found that sugarcane cultivation was incredibly profitable, and they really modeled a system based on the early Atlantic islands, those of uh, the Madeira, Canary Islands, the Azores, really labor-intensive harvesting and shipping of sugar on these plantations um, using gangs of labor and whether, whatever source um, and um, shipping it back to England. Excuse me. So that's actually where I'm going to cut it today because I would like for you to answer this question as part of your discussion board. Okay, so this is the last part of the chapter. It's only, I'm looking at it right now, two and a half, three pages. I want you to really unearth this question. I'm going to remember post this as a discussion board. I'm going to give you maybe a couple other things to go off of, okay? Um, and really try to tie this all in, because up until this point, we're, we're talking about, let's go back to another map, larger one, there we go. Um, initially, we started by talking about what was happening in Africa, and of course, into the Americas. But what about when they get around Africa? What about here now? 
And that's what we're going to be talking about in the discussion boards. I look forward to what you all have to say. And keep in mind to please be safe as the hurricane approaches. Um, be in contact with me if, um, if anything arises for you. If you have difficulty with the storm, um, I'll be, of course, happy to work around any type of complexities you guys have. Um, uh, let's see, anything else? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, I was very happy to see the primary source analyses up. I was really happy with that, the discussions you all had. I will have those grades, um, I, I guess, this week since um, class is now canceled tomorrow. Um, so I will get some grading done and have those back to you next week. In addition to that and the map assignments, which you emailed me, which look fantastic. And I'm really excited to look at those and more in depth. But... Um, I'm glad to see y'all are getting underway and really contributing to this class and having a really lively discussion. I really appreciate it. So, um, yeah, I'll see you next time. I'll post the discussion board shortly.